So um, good afternoon, uh, colleagues, and welcome to this afternoon's uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Stephen Barclay. I work clinically as a doctor in the hospice in Cambridge and in general practice, and I'm a university senior lecturer in palliative and end-of-life care. One of the interesting aspects of being a, an academic, a clinical academic in palliative and end-of-life care in Cambridge is that my academic area is that which happens to all of us. Birth, taxation and death, as they say, are inevitable parts of life. And so my research area is slightly unusual in that it's not one of the rare diseases in which Cambridge is uh, notable. Uh, for its expertise, but is the medical condition with 100% incidence. So how are we as a university contributing to end-of-life care? So what I would like to cover is just a little bit of introduction to kind of set the scene. Uh, I'm conscious that clearly what I'm talking about is emotionally pretty charged area and one that um, may be close to home to many of us. The research group that I run, uh, we have published quite widely, and I'm going to be talking about some of our publications. And part of, of what we do is to question some of the perceived wisdom. And to what extent is there an evidence base for the perceived wisdom? So it's the statements that you will see out there quite widely that most people prefer to die at home. Is that the case? That something called anticipatory prescribing, putting drugs in place before a patient needs them. Is that really best practice? Advanced care planning, having those conversations in advance before a patient becomes really, a person becomes really ill. Um, what's the evidence base for that? Um, electronic record sharing, uh, is that um, effective? And what are the challenges of that? And then one of the big ethical and practical challenges we face is about hydration right at the end of life. So I'm going to do a little bit of a, a gallop through some of our research and some of the issues and the questions that we have raised that we are frequently in debate with policymakers about. And I'm going to end by just highlighting the other aspect of being an, an, an academic is clearly teaching. And one of my privileges over the last 15 years has been to see the medical student teaching uh, progressively develop to now being a substantial part of our course um, and recognized by the General Medical Council Chief Executive uh, as an exemplar of best practice. So just to set the scene and forgive me colleagues if this is familiar uh, to you, uh, these are the latest uh, national data from the Office of National Statistics and the most common place of death in this country, this is England and Wales, is in the acute hospital setting with 47% of deaths in that setting. Uh, in excess of 500,000 people die every year in England and Wales. And so 47% in hospitals, 23% in their own home, 22% in care homes, 7% in hospices, and 2% in other places. If you divide that, those data down by cancer, which is the green lines, and non-cancer, which are the red lines, then you'll see that um, the most common place of death for both cancer and non-cancer remains in the acute hospital. 71% of deaths in this country are from non cancer causes, 29% from cancer causes. And you could see at home and in care homes, uh, again, large numbers of non-cancer deaths. Look at the hospices, and I think there is some provocative data there. I've already told you that 71% of all deaths in this country are from non-cancer, and of those, just 1% occur in hospices. Now hospice care is much more than where people die, but there are major issues uh, that the hospice movement is exercised by in terms of inequalities 
that it still tends to be hospice care um, in disproportionately for people with cancer. And just really to finish this introduction, there are, there are broadly recognized to be four what are called trajectories of dying. So for some people, death happens really suddenly with no palliative phase, no previous warning. The classic is the terminal illness of cancer and other conditions where there's an accelerating decline, decline in function as death approaches. The third group is the much more unpredictable, what are called entry, re-entry deaths of conditions like heart failure and chronic chest disease. And then actually the biggest group in the UK is the fourth one there of chronic frailty. And these are the conditions and these are the pathways or the trajectories to death that uh, are recognized, although in fact they are oversimplifications. Just to come on to our group's research then. The first assertion that you will see widely sedated is that most people would prefer to die at home. Well, we have undertaken quite a, an extensive amount of research in this area, led by uh, my PhD colleague, uh, Dr. Sarah Hoare, who is now a, a postdoctoral researcher in our department. And we just asked the question, is that really the case? And so that first paper there, uh, which is uh, available by, these are all available open access, so the journals, uh, you can access them um, for free. What Sarah did in that paper, and I don't expect you to read all of this, but down here at the bottom are the names of all the UK papers, which are papers in which patients' preferences for place of death have been recorded in research studies. So these are cancer patients, patients with multiple conditions, non-cancer patients, studies in which it wasn't stated, and then public uh, opinion surveys. And this orange color is for home. And it's on the basis of this sort of research that this black line, which is the median, the, the sort of middle, these black lines. So in all of these groups, that's comfortably over 50%. Yes, but, when you look at those studies carefully, we need to add in the red bars, which is the data that is missing in these research studies. So in many of these, if you look at this group here of the people with multiple conditions, if you look at the research, many people did not have a preference or it was not a recorded preference or they weren't asked. And that uh, echoes with my clinical practice that if you ask someone where they would prefer to die, many people, they say, well, that depends on how well I'm supported, doctor. That depends on how much my family um, are able to support me. So if you add in the missing data, which we need to do if we're going to be scientific, these black lines fall below 50%. The, the, um, the not stated uh, group is slightly above 50%. But I put to you that the evidence of this is that we frankly don't know where many people would prefer to die because many people don't have a particularly strong preference. And indeed we know place is much less important than being comfortable. So that is an example of how we have in our research, we have questioned, and now this was picked up uh, by Professor Bewey, who's the National Clinical Director for End of Life Care in NHS England. Uh, when she first saw our paper, she, she got in touch with me and said, Stephen, I've been feeling uncomfortable about this dogma that home is where most people want to be. Thank you for the first time you've given me evidence that this is indeed the case. Let me move on then to another area. What is now, for those of us who are clinicians, uh, which may not be the majority of us, but uh, there is widespread practice that when someone is recognized that the end of life is sadly drawing near, 
and they're at home or in a care home. It's widely believed to be good practice to put in place some injectable medications for pain, for anxiety, for breathlessness, for agitation, and for terminal secretions, just in case they are needed in the future. And uh, another of my current PhD students, Ben Bowers, uh, published a very high profile systematic literature review in which he asked, well, what's the evidence for this widespread practice, particularly in general practice? And the answer is, it's the emperor's new clothes. The research is entirely based on what doctors and nurses think is good for patients. Astonishingly, there is not a single published research study that, uh, that tells us what patients and family members think about having these drugs in place. And Ben is in fact at the moment completing uh, that first study uh, as part of his PhD uh, work. And he published an interview study concerning uh, GP's views. And then down here, this became uh, very salient in the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm gonna say a little bit more about that. Uh, but Ben published a very high profile editorial in the British Medical Journal, because one of the potential issues is that if the COVID-19 pandemic were to get really severe, we might be asking family members to administer end-of-life care drugs should uh, there be an overwhelming number of people at the end of their life uh, that the nursing services are overwhelmed. Uh, and he wrote a really helpful editorial highlighting that this is a really big ask for family members. What about advanced care planning? Again, there's a big impetus to encourage people to have conversations and to plan and to say what their preferences would be should they reach the point that they're unable to say for themselves what their preferences are. This was a study I was involved with concerning, uh, we, we interviewed a, a number of people in residential care homes around advanced care planning. And people were at a whole range from um, talking about death and having spoken to staff and having made a plan to living in the present day by day in their care home. And indeed to some people talking about moving back home or living in the past, the overwhelming majority of care home residents were living day to day and not particularly thinking about the future. So we need to be wary of saying to people, in this case in care home setting, let's have a plan for what might happen down the road. Is that us as professionals imposing on patients what they may not wish to do if actually, frankly, thank you, doctor, but I'm focused on living day to day. So uh, one of my current colleagues who we hope will shortly receive PhD funding, Dr. Sarah Hopkins, who's a geriatrician working in my research group, um, has just recently published a systematic review of the literature concerning advanced care plans. And Sarah published again a, an editorial in the British Medical Journal that highlighted we need to rethink what we mean by advanced care planning. And she emphasizes in that uh, editorial that this isn't about a document and a decision so much as developing a shared narrative. So what are the, what's important to uh, our patients? Um, and what are their values so that we can plan in a way that would work for them and be consistent with their values. Another major issue uh, that is arising uh, in health services is can we optimize the sharing of data concerning patients in the community as they approach the end of their lives? I was reflecting with my research group recently that it's astonishing that health care is largely structured around one third of the week. 
which is the in hours, Monday to Friday, normal working hours. Two thirds of the week, which is evenings, weekends, and bank holidays, are somehow a skeleton staff is thought to be adequate. And is this okay? And clearly it isn't okay. But one of the challenges when I work as a, uh, a, as a doctor out of hours and I'm called to see people close to the end of their lives is do I have the information that I need? Because that patient is calling me, uh, not as their GP. I don't necessarily have access to their records. And one of the challenges is working out what, what the care plan has been formulated by the in hours team. And so this has been another major strand of our work to try to inform this debate in terms of how we can best share information clearly with patient consent. And so we, we published one paper here around eight years in which the uh, NHS has been seeking to develop these what are called EPACs, electronic palliative care coordination systems. Uh, we're now 10 years on and they are still a major source of tension um, and difficulty to actually get this up and running effectively. I know it sounds extraordinary, but in this day and age, GP records and hospital records and out of our services records, electronic records don't talk to each other. They're different systems and sharing of data still isn't happening. And then we've went further on in the International Journal of Medical Informatics to an interview study um, in which some practitioners and, and GPs and practice managers were saying they thought this is brilliant, this is obvious. Um, and others were saying this is just chaotic, that systems don't talk and they didn't really see the utility. And then we added um, a debate piece in terms of the debate around data sharing. Uh, and then we were astonished and we published in the Journal of Medical Ethics, or BMC Medical Ethics, that we had in a simple study when we were seeking to interview healthcare professionals and patients concerning data sharing, we had to ask 89 different people for their consent to get through the processes. And so there's something fundamental that needs to be changed around, the, around the, the governance for research. And that's been picked up uh, by uh, central authorities. This is a, a paper. Um, it's, I can't show you the actual print version because it's only just been accepted uh, by the British Medical Journal of Supportive and Palliative Care. And this raises questions around a patient right at the end of their life. One of the biggest clinical challenges is as patients become weaker and patients become sicker and more drowsy, they are not able to take food and they're not able to take fluids in the way that they were able to previously. And this is a major cause of concern for us as practitioners, for patients, and it's a huge source of anxiety to family members as well. This issue came to the fore with the Liverpool Care Pathway that colleagues may be familiar with uh, that was being misused uh, and family members were concerned that their loved ones had been unhelpfully and inappropriately deprived of fluids. So uh, this is an academic clinical fellow. So Arjun was in fact a medical student uh, here in Cambridge. Uh, he's trained, he's now training as a junior doctor, training to become a consultant in palliative medicine and is back with our research group as an academic clinical fellow, part-time clinical training, part-time academic training. And he has reviewed all the research literature around should we put up a drip in the last week and or few days of life. 
and he's now conducting an interview study with doctors and nurses uh, in hospitals and hospices across the east of England. Uh, and in doing those interviews, colleagues have said, wow, Arjun, this is so important because this is such a source of concern. The bottom line, I'm afraid, of his literature review is the evidence is still really thin. One of the challenges of being a clinical academic in palliative and end of life care is the thin evidence base, the small research workforce. And one of our ambitions, as I'll say at the end, is to develop Cambridge from where we are now as a national leading centre in palliative and end of life care research. Um, we are seeking to um, develop to become one of the leading centres because the evidence base for so many of these important questions simply isn't there. And so um, let's, let me talk just briefly about the pandemic and then I'll talk about medical students and then open for questions. When the pandemic struck in March, there was big concern that people would be dying very badly in the community. And so we undertook during April a very rapid national survey of um, colleagues involved in community end of life care that we were able to publish within weeks of completing the survey in British Medical Journal Supportive and Palliative Care. And this was the first study that's been published that has shown how much prescribing uh, and drug management has changed. We have at the moment just completed a national survey of the changes in bereavement care during the pandemic. We've received over 800 replies from colleagues across the UK. Uh, watch this space. We'll be publishing that shortly. Bereavement is rising up the agenda. And just this morning, I was in conversation with colleagues in the Department of Health and Social Care who are very exercised uh, concerning the tsunami of people struggling with bereavement that is, is coming. And they have turned to our research group to ask if we can help them research and develop the evidence base, which of course we're delighted to do. So COVID, I find this a helpful um, graphic. This is not mine, um, but there is clearly, um, I know we're talking of second wave, this is wave in a rather different sort. So there has been the first wave of immediate mortality and morbidity. Then there's the second wave on the impact of resources on urgent non-COVID conditions. Cancer patients have had their treatment stopped for concerns. And then there's been the third phase of interrupted care on chronic conditions. So people with diabetes and other conditions and heart disease maybe haven't had their reviews as expected. And I think one of the biggest long-term uh, effects that we're beginning to wake up to is the psychological trauma, the mental illness, the economic injury, and for the health and social care workforce, the burnout. And so our bereavement care research is trying to inform that area. And as I say, we've got the Department of Health um, and social care um, are very interested in our work. I'm not going to go into the details of this because time doesn't permit. But we have been working very closely with the Cambridgeshire and Peterborough Clinical Commissioning Group to develop an end of life care flowchart during the pandemic. So how does end of life care change given the restrictions of the pandemic? And the flowchart that we were involved in developing has been taken up nationally by the Royal College of General Practitioners and several other areas. So I'm happy to go into this uh, if people are interested, uh, but practice has changed quite fundamentally. Uh, my GP colleagues are really concerned to be upskilled in end of life care. Just yesterday evening, I spent an hour and a half with the Royal College of GP uh, webinar uh, 
um, organized for over 150 colleagues from across the country and indeed across the world. Uh, and this is one of the slides uh, that I used with them that you need to exclude reversible causes, um, continue practicing much as usual, and just be wary about exhausting drug supplies. So we've also researched our medical student teaching. So uh, one of our med students uh, who had a, an arts background uh, worked with myself and my university um, anatomy colleagues uh, for an analysis of this medical students' reflections on their experience of the dissecting room. And uh, knowing everything and yet nothing about her was one of their quotes uh, from that study that they had done full body dissection, which we still do in Cambridge. So they knew a person intimately in one way, but in another way, never knew the individual at all. And we've undertaken longitudinal studies with our students concerning their attitudes towards end of life care. I have the privilege of giving the first lecture to our medical students when they arrive in the university aged 18 on their very first day. And that is because Dr. Cecilia Brassett, the university anatomist, um, invites me in uh, and I talk to them about our research about the dissecting room and help them to contextualize that in terms of this experience of death and dying. Two thirds of our students have never seen a dead body before, but we ask them in their first week to pick up a scalpel. And one of my concerns is what does that do to them and their, their empathy? And so we're researching uh, that area. We've also researched medical students' experience of bereavement. And so I published this with Dr. Diana Wood, who's our clinical dean and colleagues. And the answer is a lot of our students and our medical students experience a close personal bereavement before they arrive in Cambridge and during the course. So if you can read this here, between 13 and 22% experience bereavement during years one to five of the course. So when I'm teaching death and dying and palliative and end of life care to our medical students, I need to be very cognizant of the fact that maybe one fifth of the people in the room are feeling really uncomfortable because they have recently lost a loved one, but we need to prepare them for that important task of looking after and caring for dying patients. And, but this, the pastoral implications of this are huge. And, and we shared this paper across the university counseling service, across the um, college counselors and uh, chaplains who are involved in a large amount of pastoral support to know that your medical students may have a particular struggle. And then we've also researched um, the experience of um, palliative and end of life care. So junior doctors, this was again one of our students who came back to me as a junior doctor um, and reviewed what is the experience of junior doctors in the literature. Uh, and the bottom line is they feel dumped in the deep end. So from day one, they're caring for dying patients, but they may have had little or no preparation. We're unusual because we've developed it considerably. And then we've uh, researched our medical students' expectations of their role in palliative care. And they write reflective essays uh, and a sociology PhD student of mine has um, analyzed those and, and reflected and, and, and um, uh, analyzed the reflections and how students are learning to care. So 12 years ago, uh, when I met with the new clinical dean, well, she wasn't that new, actually, maybe longer than 12 years ago, um, she sat me down and said, Stephen, we'd like to develop, please, some palliative care teaching. Uh, there were three years of the clinical course, uh, and there was one half day. And so with Dr. Wood's warm support, we have progressively worked over the last uh, 12 years or so, to the point that now, palliative and end of life care, we have 29 half days 
in the course. We run seminars, we run small groups, lectures. We ensure that our students meet patients approaching the end of their life in years four and year five and year six. Uh, we ask them to reflect, to write reflective essays. We clearly debrief them carefully. Uh, palliative care, relatively unusual for medical schools. We routinely examine palliative care in finals because this is a core skill for all junior doctors. And, and I have the privilege of co-leading uh, the national group of medical school teachers in palliative care. We have our conference coming up uh, just uh, next month. And I'm going to end with two quotations from our medical student colleagues. So these both were received this summer. So I started my first rotation as a doctor in April on the West Suffolk Hospital end of life and COVID ward. And this doctor is going to be working there until Christmas. On most days, I've been involved in looking after end of life patients, informing families of poor prognosis, and working closely with the palliative care services. Understandably nervous at the beginning. This was an unsolicited email. I have to say, I have felt incredibly prepared for these responsibilities. And this colleague wrote to thank me and my colleagues for the palliative care course. So unlike many others who feel in the deep end and unprepared, yes, they were in the deep end, but mercifully through our teaching, they felt they'd been able to be prepared. And this, this was another lovely email I received from another colleague who again wrote to say a massive thank you. Um, it was often a topic of conversation about my peers. Um, it's quite nice this to say that palliative care is the best taught specialty in Cambridge. And they say it is down to the passion and time we have poured into their teaching. And we do put a huge amount of time into it. And if, if this is what we're doing, if we are crafting a generation of Cambridge doctors who are comfortable and compassionate, then I feel job done. And I have to say, emails like this make all the hard work of teaching hugely worthwhile. One of the, this is one of the slides I show to our students. This was a lady who was uh, in hospital in Wigan. This was the British Medical Journal photo of the week. And this was a lady dying from lung cancer in Wigan General Hospital. And one of the staff asked this lady a question that I encourage our students to ask, which was, uh, can you tell me what's important to you, given that time is now short? And to their astonishment, this lady said, I want to see Bronwyn, which wasn't what they expected. They thought it was about being comfortable or my family visiting, but Bronwyn was a horse that this lady had looked after for 15 years. She knew she was dying, but she wanted to say goodbye to Bronwyn. And so here you are, this was pre-COVID. They did exactly that. They brought Sheila Marsh down to the car park and they brought Bronwyn to say goodbye to her. And she died 36 hours later. She had achieved her final wish because someone had asked that important question, can you tell me what's important to you? I, I always brings a tear to my eye when I see that photograph. Uh, but if that isn't good palliative and end of life care, I have to say to you, I don't know what is. So this is our ambition. We have growing recognition for both our research and our teaching. But Cambridge at the moment, although our academic area has a 100% incidence, uh, there is no department of palliative care. There is no professor of palliative care. Um, and we're working towards that um, to, to see if we can um, establish that uh, with the university fundraisers. But our goal 
is to establish Cambridge as an international centre of research and teaching. I believe we're poised to get there, but that's the next step to establish a professorship uh, and to build um, maybe not necessarily a department of our own, but certainly a sustainable body of researchers. So I'm going to stop at that point and I'm going to open this up now for um, questions. So I believe what I'm supposed to do now is to stop the share and open um, the question and answers. So uh, thank you colleagues. Um, if you would like to um, key in more questions, uh, then please do so and I'll try to get through these um, one by one. So um, what I will do now is um, I'll answer this one, which is when someone has progressive dementia, when do you do end of life care planning? Uh, Martin, thank you for that really helpful and challenging question. Because if you start too late, then you will have missed the boat. Uh, but if you start too soon, then it may not be welcome to the patient. And this is one of the challenges with end of life care planning uh, overall. And I think, and one of the things I certainly teach our students is to offer people the opportunity to talk about the what if and the what when, not to force it on people, but to give them an opportunity to say, well, should this condition get worse? Um, are there things that you would like us to know about? Um, so while I'm a, an enthusiast for end of life care planning, uh, I'm not an enthusiast for forcing it on people. Uh, some of the language we use and encourage our students to use is to talk about things like rainy day plans so that you know those of us who have children you know we have a plan when it's school holidays um, what are we going to do when it's pouring with rain well we've got something on the shelf um, and we've got a plan uh, but let's hope the sun will shine or sometimes we talk about parallel planning let's hope for the best but plan for the worst so make it very clear that the opportunity is there i'm happy to talk um, and make that opportunity uh, repeatedly um, available uh, a couple of um, questions uh, that our topics don't seem to cover how to deal with those to wish to accelerate their death to end their suffering um, and there's another question um, about this um, as well. Um, do you think all efforts should be made to keep going um, or should it be possible to accept requests to stop treatment? So uh, there are several questions in there. Uh, Tony, thank you for that um, question. So uh, I think there are two questions there. So the first is if a patient wishes to stop treatment, we actually have a legal requirement that we must do so. So if the patient has capacity and says, I don't want to continue chemotherapy, then to continue it is, constitutes assault. So a, a, a refusal of treatment, we have to respect. The more difficult question is a request for assistance to end someone's life, be that physician assisted suicide or euthanasia. Um, we actually have a teaching session for our medical students explicitly on this area because they need to be aware of these issues. Um, we have done some limited research in that area that I didn't mention today. The bottom line of certainly what we say to our students is, that you need to be aware and you need to know how to handle such requests, but you need to be very clear that the law of the land at the moment is that this is not legal. And if as doctors, you are involved in assisting someone's death, um, then uh, you can face 
a prison sentence. So this drills down to major issues uh, of um, our personal beliefs. And uh, I personally um, can see the force both ways, both in terms of those who wish to see uh, euthanasia legislated for and those who have grave concerns about it. Uh, you may say that's sitting on the fence, but I think um, actually genuinely, I think there is a debate to be had, and I think we should be encouraging that debate. Uh, but at the moment, uh, the legislation is clear, and we're very clear with our students that it is not possible for them to be involved in this. But we encourage them to encourage patients to articulate um, what it is that you're particularly struggling with, and are there things that we can help with this? I hope that's helpful. Um, has the proportion of people dying in hospital been increasing? If so, why is it? Um, interestingly, actually, no, the proportion of people dying in hospital has been decreasing. Uh, up until about four or five years ago, it was over 50%. It is now, as I mentioned, at 47%. So the proportion dying in hospital is slowly decreasing, though it's the most prevalent place of death, um, as I've mentioned. Uh, and this may be partly an acceptance that sometimes uh, it is best to be keeping people at home to keep them comfortable. But I think we need to beware demonizing death in hospital. Uh, a lot of people, it is appropriate for an admission to go into hospital. Sometimes reversibility is not clear and therefore they need investigation. We need to be sure that this condition is not reversible. And sometimes, frankly, the support is not there in the community. And if it's not there in the community, then, then hospital is the place that at least care can be provided. I'm working really hard with our CCG um, and the, the um, prospect is looking good for increased resources to support more people at home, if appropriate, with hospital at home and other um, similar type of services. Um, uh, a question around um, what has been the barrier to getting good NHS electronic patient data system? Wow, Peter, what an interesting um, question. Uh, there was an initiative um, some years ago now where enormous amounts of um, uh, uh, NHS funds uh, were spent on uh, uh, an, an NHS IT system and that failed. Uh, and the details of that uh, I won't go into now, but there was a, a major initiative to get one IT system across the whole of the NHS. And that was a spectacular and extremely expensive uh, failure. Um, there are initiatives underway, um, uh, but one of the barriers is that different organizations have their own different IT systems. And there has been, there's been no will uh, from the center. There has been a desire locally, um, but there's been no will from the center to, um, or no push from the center for that, that, that seems to be coming now. Uh, and it's, it's rival companies to a certain extent who are, um, have their own um, uh, systems that don't talk to each other uh, Hopefully, that is going to improve. It is a disgrace that when my patient is admitted to Addenbrooke's Hospital, uh, the Addenbrooke's Hospital team uh, can't, without separate logins, um, uh, see what I've written in my GP um, record. Uh, I've I think there was a question here from Gareth about have we done any work on patient requests from medical assistants? Um, we have done some work on that. Um, a paper by Gemma Clark in PLOS One was a, a national survey we did in the UK, in the US, um, concerning um, progressive dementia that you might be um, 
interested in. Uh, I'm just trying to gallop through these um, quickly enough. Um, so Pauline is asking um, a, a theological bioethicist, how much re does religion feature in your end of life care teaching? And what teaching and learning models do you use with medical students? Brilliant, thank you Pauline for that. Um, so uh, I've just been teaching our fourth year medical students just this week, uh, an, an introduction to palliative care. And in that we have emphasized for them that palliative care is physical, psychological, social, and existential. And whether people uh, have particular religious beliefs or not, uh, what I have been emphasizing to our students is when a patient is dying, they'll have physical symptoms, they'll have psychological distress, they'll have social distress, but they will also have existential or spiritual, whatever term you'd like to use, the questions of meaning and purpose and fairness and regrets and what's my life been about. And for some people, that is the major area in which they are struggling. So um, I do work quite closely with our chaplaincy colleagues. So for example, in the bereavement teaching and research that we're doing, um, I work very closely with this, one of the senior chaplains at Addenbrooke's Hospital, um, who's very involved in bereavement care. And as we're probably all aware, chaplains sometimes work in a theological framework. Most of the time, they're just not operating in any particular theological framework when they're working with patients. They're there to encourage people to uh, articulate uh, their, uh, their, the issues they want uh, to talk about. Um, a question here about, does my teaching of medical students and academic involvement extend to other countries? Uh, for example, the USA, I mentioned the one study that we did, we did an Ipsos Mori study of a thousand people in the UK and the US concerning this issue of desire to hasten death. Um, I would love to be able to extend my academic involvement. It's, to be honest, a challenge of capacity, which takes me back to the issue of wanting to build a department here. I've had visiting academics from the US uh, come to see me. Um, I had the head of palliative care in uh, Jordan and uh, Palestine come to visit recently, wanting to develop uh, research and teaching links. Um, and we've had links with, with colleagues in India and, and in Africa as well. Um, I would love to develop that. Um, there's only one of me uh, and I've got a research group of 15 and I've got 300, 900 medical students to teach. So. Um, we've just got a new university lecturer colleague, which is terrific. So would love to do that. Um, and colleagues, um, my email address, uh, please do get in touch with me afterwards because I'd love to develop um, any of these um, questions. Um, question about the Liverpool Care Pathway. Was it based on sound research or fundamentally flawed? Should it have been abandoned? Did media commentary and attack just misunderstand it? Um, in a nutshell, uh, this was an attempt to bring the best of hospice care into the hospital setting, the community setting, and the care home setting. Uh, my take is that it was ethically absolutely sound and based on best ethical principles. The problem was the way it was implemented and it was implemented and used in a way that was positively damaging for some people. And that's what the media picked up with. Um, and therefore it was um, abandoned. You're quite right in your question. Uh, it lacked a solid research evidence base. And, and one of the problems in palliative care is that it was a great idea it is intuitively, let's go ahead and do it. If we'd done some research before it had been implemented, we would have picked up that it was potentially going to be misunderstood and therefore needed to be really carefully introduced. That research wasn't done. It was misused when people hadn't been adequately prepared 
and educated and damage was done and the whole ship went down. It's very similar, I mentioned anticipatory prescribing. It seems a no-brainer. Why not get the drugs in place so when you need them, they're immediately available? The research isn't there, and some of the research that we're doing is raising questions of safety, actually, um, and prescribing, and, and who is deciding to administer. So again, you need to be careful. Bright ideas aren't always terribly bright ideas. Um, a, a question here, do you think there's a place in the UK for assisted suicide in the approach to end of life care? I think that's a really difficult question. Uh, as I say, I, I think that I can see the argument for, but I can also see the argument against. Um, and uh, I, you may feel I'm dodging the issue. Um, I can feel the force of both sides of the argument, because um, I think we need to be honest that despite best palliative care, um, sometimes um, the final phase of life is frankly not great, uh, particularly true in non-malignant disease. Uh, but whether that amounts to um, crossing what I think is potentially a significant line in terms of assisted suicide um, is a really difficult question. Um, and at the moment, we obviously have to operate within the legal um, framework. So um, I think the jury's out on that one, uh, and it's a really difficult one. Uh, you said Bronwyn could see Sheila pre-COVID, uh, and the, there were no face masks. Thank you, Jim, for that question. Are we overreacting to the risk of COVID when restricting end-of-life wishes? Wow, what an interesting question. Um, I have a relative uh, whose mother died in a care home recently. They weren't able to visit for weeks and weeks and weeks. When it was recognized that she was dying, and indeed the anticipatory prescribing drugs were put in place, then the family were able to visit. At least they were able to see her before she died. I think the whole business of COVID restriction is a really difficult one. Um, while at one level it seems very obvious what the right thing to do is, um, at, at another level, um, we've got to balance risks and the whole um, mental health damage and, and people in care homes um, and dying people and family members and this tsunami of bereavement of, of people whose grief has been particularly traumatic because they aren't, weren't able to see um, the loved ones. So I am galloping through these. It's great to have all these questions. The numbers are adding up and up and up. My word, I need to keep going. What's the role of living wills in end of life care? So um, that's where people can make a legally binding document uh, in advance, should they then lose the decision-making capacity. Uh, so you can either write a document, which is called an advanced decision to refuse treatment, or um, you can appoint someone with a lasting power of attorney. And these are legally binding, uh, and those, person, those people can make decisions uh, in your place should you not be able to decide. So if the patient still has independent um, and decision-making capacity, then a living will does not come into play. But certainly in a condition like dementia, we encourage people to appoint someone with lasting power of attorney for health and welfare, as well as for finance, um, so that someone who they trust can make decisions in their place. Uh, and I hope that helps. Um, the respect form. So this is a new form uh, of um, allowing people to state their preferences and wishes um, uh, in advance. Uh, it incorporates a do not resuscitate um, uh, form, but puts it in the wider context of what the patient's preferences are, what the uh, clinical um, priorities might be. The respect form for colleagues who don't know, you can look it up. Uh, on, on the web was actually developed by a bioethics clinical colleague of, of ours here, Dr. Zoe Fritz. Um, it looks like it's the direction of travel. Uh, 
uh, it's being widely implemented in hospitals and the community across the country. I think it is a real advance uh, on just having a DNA CPR form in isolation because resuscitation conversations need to be in the context of where are we in the course of your illness. So another question here, seeing the hospice is mostly related to cancer patients, would you think the medical school at Cambridge would enhance collaborations with oncology um, uh, specialists to enhance your palliative care research and education? So um, we already have fantastically good relationships with our oncology colleagues, some of whom are involved uh, in our teaching and certainly in our research. I've done quite a lot of research and I'm doing quite a lot of research with our oncology um, colleagues. Um, so that's great that we have that here in Cambridge. Uh, we're seeking to develop also our research and our teaching with our colleagues working, looking after people with non-malignant life-limiting illness, such as our colleagues working in the Department of Medicine for the Elderly, respiratory medicine, um, heart failure. Um, Cambridge is the most wonderful opportunity uh, for cross-discipline and cross-specialty um, collaboration. Um, what inspired you to follow this path? Was it an incident in your career or life? Wow, what an interesting question. Thank you. Um, I don't mind sharing uh, that yes, there was indeed. And that was the death of my mother when I was aged seven. Uh, and I know that has fundamentally changed my life. Uh, uh, my mother was a consultant surgeon, one of two consultant surgeons who were women in the entire country at that time, so she must have been quite a lady. Um, and that has put steel into my bones, if you will, uh, to make um, my role in medicine to uh, advance our knowledge and to advance our teaching uh, in palliative care because we have only one chance to get this one right. And if end of life care is delivered well, then that makes a huge difference for the memory of those who live after, let alone, of course, for the person um, themselves. Has any of your research contraindicated your own clinical experience? Um, I wouldn't say contraindicated, the two very definitely feed off each other. So many of our research questions, that one about should we put up a drip at the end of life, is very much fed by um, the regular conversations with family members to say, look, I'm really worried that my loved one isn't able to drink, they're unconscious, surely they're thirsty, their mouth looks really dry, could you put up a drip please? Um, and so that feeds into, well, what's the evidence for the benefits and, and harms of that? Um, and certainly my clinical experience feeds my teaching um, because I am continually using stories for my clinical practice to um, illustrate um, the, the points that I'm trying to make. Um, and then do the participants in the study showing that over 80 people's permission is needed um, so, sorry, I probably didn't explain very well. So it wasn't that 80 people's permission was needed for information sharing. That was the ethical and research governance processes that are labyrinthine. Um, so um, if, if a patient says, I'm happy for you to share, then we can share within the electronic system. I'm sorry, I didn't explain that very well. But to do research in that really rather simple study, um, so doing clinical research remains really complex and you've got ethics and you've got governance um, and it was the research rather than the data sharing um, was um, the challenge. I'm sorry I didn't explain that particularly. Um, I think one can request to stop being fed artificially but that it is unwise to stop artificial hydration because that can cause pain. Is that true? So certainly, Sally, you're absolutely right that if a patient says, I don't want you to give me a drip, or I don't want you to feed me artificially by a tube, if the patient declines that, and that is tube hydration 
or tube nutrition is defined as a medical treatment and therefore a patient can refuse it. And if they refuse it, we have to take the tube down. Um, the challenge is, does it cause pain or does it cause suffering? Um, that's one of the things that um, Arjun Kingdon in his literature review, um, the evidence is unclear. What we really want to know is from patients within the last 24, 48 hours of life, are you thirsty? Are you hungry? Are you in pain? And they're the very people who we need to know the answer to, but we can't know the answer to because they're, they're unconscious or semi-conscious at that time. Um, what, we, what I can tell you from clinical experience of myself and colleagues is that it is our clinical experience that provided our nurses are really careful in keeping the mouth moist with sponges and um, um, lollipops and ground up ice cubes. It is our perception that most people don't suffer and don't suffer from dehydration. Um, but I have to say that's the perception. Uh, we don't have scientific um, data for that. That's an area that we want to um, get um, into. So thank you for a colleague here for um, that I avoided technical language. Um, but given that hospices are charities, is there a momentum behind the, the move to make hospice a care, care available to all by full incorporation into the NHS? Wow. Um, sorry, let me click on it. Really interesting question. So I think the hospice movement, one of its strengths was that it was independently and charitably funded and therefore they could get on and develop without uh, the sometimes... Um, slow and rather sclerotic decision-making NHS processes. Um, most hospices have substantial NHS funding, uh, but substantial charitable funding as well. So um, I think the long-term future is exactly as you're suggesting, Mark. Thank you for that suggestion. That why is it that, um, that end-of-life care and hospice care is it's okay for it to be charitably funded. Uh, why is that different from um, heart attack treatment or appendicitis or maternity care? Um, no one suggests that um, it should be a charity that funds having your appendix taken out. Why is it acceptable that it's a charity that looks after you at the end of life? And I think that's a real challenge to the NHS as a whole. So thank you um, for raising that. Um, another really interesting question, is there a socioeconomic factor behind where people are dying? Um, and is dying at home more prevalent amongst those with the financial resources to afford private end of life care? Ursula, you are completely on the button there, spot on. Uh, the places in the country that have the highest home death rates are the most affluent, and the places in the country that are the most socioeconomically de deprived, by and large, have the lowest home death rates. So socioeconomic factors are hugely influential. Uh, and I'm doing work locally with our clinical commissioning group. Uh, South Cambridgeshire is one of the most affluent parts of the entire country and has a very high um, home death rate. But we have the Fens and Wisbeach, uh, which is socioeconomically deprived. And I've just had a message to say we're running over time and we've got five minutes left. Um, Brian, I think if it's OK, I've kind of answered your question about hospices. Um, uh, Care homes, can I pick up on that one so we're not going to have time to answer all the questions. I think the pandemic has highlighted that care homes were the big area of disaster in the community in terms of COVID. We had one care home recently that um, 20 people died, a quarter of their population died in the space of 10 days from COVID. Uh, a quarter of our population die in care homes and they are a major locus of end-of-life care that have largely been neglected up till now. 
So I think one of the biggest opportunities is to raise their profile, and COVID sadly has done that. Um, and um, actually, I've got one PhD student, a new one joining me, researching uh, that area. Uh, so I think the biggest opportunity is to raise the profile. And there is actually a major change in the GP contract that is requiring GPs to up their game in care home provision, including end of life care. Care homes are the poor relation uh, in many ways uh, in terms of care for our population. They are the most vulnerable people, amongst the most vulnerable people in our population. It's not acceptable that they are um, the most um, neglected. Um, uh, a question here, sorry, I'm not going to be able to answer these all. Uh, a patient's favoured place of death, is this likely to change in time during um, a long illness? Absolutely correct. Uh, there is clear evidence that the closer people get to death, the lower, uh, that the, their preference for, place for death at home declines. So that if you ask people early on, they say, yeah, I'd really prefer to die at home. But as they get sicker, uh, and as they see the stress on their family, and loved ones, and maybe as they see that maybe the community services aren't there. So preference for death at home does decline um, as, as illness progresses. Um, sorry, someone is asking for my email address. Um, let me, I'll say it out to you now, colleagues. It's SIGB2, Stephen IGB2 at cam.ac.uk. And I'm very happy to, for people to um, email me. Um, and if I can be cheeky, if people have got suggestions as to how we can build capacity here uh, and secure funding for a professorship, um, I would be delighted um, to hear from people, but also um, other colleagues as well. Um, question here, I was shocked to hear there have been suggestions about family members being asked to administer drugs if the pandemic gets out of hand. Um, so I, can I elaborate on that? Um, thank you for raising that, Chris. Um, uh, the answer is it's widely established practice, certainly in rural Australia, uh, because you can't get the doctors or the nurses there in time. Uh, it is practiced in some parts of the UK, uh, in North Wales and in rural Lincolnshire, but on the whole, not. Um, there was big concern that people would be dying with uncontrolled symptoms and they would be waiting hours and hours and hours for a nurse to come and visit. Um, I'm told this is our last question. Sorry, colleagues, um, but I, I will answer this one. Um, and so the, um, the question arose, might there in some cases be family members who would be able and willing to administer drugs, uh, either by injection or by uh, these same drugs can be absorbed through the lining of the mouth. So I think uh, our BMJ editorial, which you can look up if you want to, uh, the lead author was Bowers, raised major concerns around that. Uh, the, the issue is really, careful, really careful selection of the family member concerned. So if they are someone who has worked in health and social care, they might be more comfortable. So if there was a daughter who was a nurse or a daughter who was a doctor, say, um, they would be able to administer, but clearly they're not their parent's um, doctor or nurse, they're their parent's daughter. So there needs to be a very clear framework what we developed locally was clear guidance that if that was going to happen, they should ring the hospice, tell them what the situation was, get confirmation about what drugs they were about to administer and the dose, uh, and that there were going to be those sorts of checks. There was going to be absolutely no pressure on family members expecting them to do that. And one of the things people would need to be briefed about was that sometimes we administer these drugs and a patient dies shortly afterwards. I remember that as a junior doctor and finding it really upsetting. 
And so we need to prepare family members to know that that sometimes happens, but the drugs and the doses that you are using do not accelerate the end. And so the two have coincided, but are not causal. Having said that, I can tell you it feels very different when you've given someone a very small dose of 2.5 milligrams of morphine and just maybe five milligrams of sedative drug midazolam because they were agitated and in pain and were dying. And then an hour later, uh, they pass away. It feels as though the drugs have caused that. And so this needs to be done really carefully. Um, and uh, people need to be maximally supported uh, in that with absolutely no pressure to do so. But there are some family members who feel, well, at least it's something I can do. That dad is distressed or my partner is distressed and they're dying badly. And it's going to be a while before the nurse comes to visit. And I've been trained and I feel comfortable. And, and I was able to give them something and they settled and then the nurse came and visited. Um, so um, it, it is potentially um, a step change, as you say, Chris, uh, and is something that we're actively wanting to research because if it's to be done, it's got to be done carefully. So I think we need to close this. Is that right, um, colleagues? So sorry, we've got further questions. Um, so um, um, I think, are we about to be closed down? Yes, sorry. The uh, administrators say we can't go on forever on this one. Um, I'm very happy for you to email me, um, sigb2 at cam.ac.uk or if you if you look me up on the university website Stephen Barclay you can find my email address there. Um, I'm been delighted to hold this um, webinar and I'm grateful for there's a lovely comment at the end thank you thank you for your passion and tireless curiosity and work um, uh, it's it's a hugely rewarding area to work in. Yes, it's got its challenges and yes, it's painful. But as I say to our students, if you can make a difference to a dying patient, um, that has its own enormous reward.